Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Donna. How are you today? Good. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Um, I, I have to say, I did some research on you, as, as, as you would expect me to do as a, as a host. And I love some of your thoughts and inspirations on YouTube. And um, I loved your bio on LinkedIn, for example, as well. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing your story <laughs> and see what you're up to today. So I always start with a kind of a very, very open question to get the ball rolling. And that is, tell us a little bit about you. Well, where were you born? Uh, have you moved around? Um, you know, about your education. How did you get your first job? Or indeed, if you did, uh -huh. um, some people don't even get a first job. They get straight into running their own business, which is amazing. Um, how how did your career progress? And then, of course, I'd love to know how you got started with all the amazing things that you're doing today. <laughs> well, those are some um, interesting, well, good questions. But also at the same time, the journey wasn't always easy to get from mm. where I started to where I'm at today. I, I, grew up in, I grew up in California in Silicon Valley. And during that time, it was the height of the tech era when computers were just first coming out and everybody was in that industry. Well, for me and my family, we lived on the other side of the tracks. So I grew up near the poverty line there while I was watching all of this abundance around me going, how do I get there? Right. And we were on welfare, food stamps. And then as I got older, I realized the next door neighbors were dumpster diving behind grocery stores to bring home day old food so my family could eat. And that was when I decided I was going to get my first job, which was at 14. And I worked in a T-shirt store um, so I could buy my own clothes and I could buy my own food from that point forward because I knew things were pretty grim. Yeah. So one of the questions and one of the things I thought about often was how do I create opportunities for myself and create opportunities for other people to have their children go to college, for example, when it wasn't afforded to me? And so mm. naturally, I decided that the, my pathway was to become a financial advisor because logically it would make sense to look at investments and insurance and financial planning and budgeting and putting that all together and saving for those types of expenses. But yes. after I was in that career, after about 10 years, I learned that that wasn't my pathway. Oh, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a, that's a, you're giving me a quick, quick run through there. Yes. Well, I, I just something that occurred to me that as you were saying, you were on the other tracks from Silicon Valley. Oh, by the way, you just taught me a new word I'd never heard before. And it's <laughs> it's a bit American, but I never heard of dumpster diving. Yes. And I have this image um, of somebody literally just diving, <laughs> diving into, into a dumpster. to yeah. gather what they want. You got the correct picture. <laughs> Yeah, it's just the visual was amazing. Yes. Um, of course, yeah, when you need food, it's a logical thing to do because we know that supermarkets throw away so much that isn't even out of date sometimes. You know, right. it's it's dreadful. It's there's so much food being wasted in the world. So Silicon Valley was on the other tracks. But did you ever go and visit over there? Or, you know, not metaphorically, physically, did you go and discover how you could get into that world? I know you um, took a track down the financial right, route. Right. Um, but were you interested at all in getting involved in the kind of tech side? Not so much in the tech industry of it. Um, I remember I was in fourth grade. And computers were the first time in the classrooms. And yeah. it was the very old DOS program where you had to sit there for like 30 minutes to program to get yes. it to do yes. one thing. 
And that totally did not interest me. But I also knew that there was this huge financial component that went along with it. So I started looking at what would it be to be a financial advisor? And I worked my way through college and I got two undergrad degrees, um, a bachelor in business administration, both in finance and marketing. And I took several courses in communication because those were the key elements of what they needed in the financial planning world. And before I finished college, I was hired on by a firm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And was that totally your decision or did you get some advice from somebody to say, go this route? Um, Completely my decision. I remember when I started at the university I had so many different interests. I didn't know how to narrow it down. So I had one Mm. person say, well, go over to the career center. You'll take an aptitude test and it will show you where all your strengths are and careers that might be good. Right. I had things like on there, like math teacher, (laughs) which was not my favorite subject in the world, but I kept looking and um, financial planner eventually surfaced. It wasn't where I was strongest, but it's where I had the greatest interest. And knowing my background growing up, I went, well, this is perfect because this fits what I'm truly passionate about, which is helping other people get ahead in life, including myself, including them, including their children. And I can affect generations by helping people understand, hey, there's this planning concept. Because I, growing up, we didn't have that. We didn't know anything. My parents were both blue collar workers. They worked paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. Yeah. What a, what a gift really. And okay. So you got involved in that industry. You got hired. How long Mm -hmm. did it take before you decided this wasn't your destiny and Mm -hmm. that you weren't interested to continue in it? How long were you in it for? Mm -hmm. I was a financial planner for 10 years. And when I first started, I absolutely loved the company and the firm. And about four or five years into being a financial planner, I had moved the ranks. So I was also the managing principal, which meant I was the compliance officer for the area. I was responsible for several offices in four different states. And then Under me, I was responsible for $500 million of other people's money. Wow. So that amount of stress, worry, and pressure started breaking down my health. It was right at the time that the management structure of the firm changed. And instead of being for middle-class America and for helping people get ahead in life and all the things I stood for, it came, we need to answer to Wall Street. So there was additional stress and and pressure put onto the management team to perform, to meet numbers. Yeah. And uh, during that time, my health started breaking down and I was two years with the medical community and doctors weren't able to figure out what was wrong with me. And that was when I turned to natural medicine and found somebody who did some type of oriental healing medicine. And I learned I couldn't digest food. Right. So I was not able to digest food for over two years. Whoa, and whoa. she said to me, there's something in your life that you're not able to digest in the outside world. Mm. And what happened was, as I was getting healthier, which only took a couple of months with some enzymes <laughs> so I could digest food. And um, I learned that it was the infidelity of my marriage and the amount of anger I was holding on to being a corporate mom running the firm where I was at, plus my marriage, plus everything else. And um, my marriage quickly ended after 14 years. And that's when I decided that um, I had what was in common with myself was me and I had to learn about me. So I moved to an ashram, which is a spiritual living community to learn about meditation and science and brainwave patterns. And why are we here? And what's our real purpose? And I took the year off from the financial services world Yes, and took my two children with me. And at the end of that, when I went to go back into the workforce, I was unhirable because it was the first global recession and nobody was hiring in my industry. And after following all of the money rolls for those 10 years, I became financially devastated. Mm. 
that so was that what around 2007 8 mm -hmm. yeah. 2006 7 8 so i was at the ashram 2008 to 2009 and it was in 2009 nobody was hiring no no yeah i i kind of launched my business around that time <laughs> and and at the time it's not today but at the time it was a wellness business and um because of my learning that i'd done the previous few years mm -hmm. and nobody wanted to know <laughs> they weren't hiring it they didn't want to treat people in the workplace they were exactly. they were letting them go <laughs> let's put it let's put it that way wow okay so how did you cope with that how did you deal with that so after having been in the ashram for how long yeah um i was there for a year for a year so yes. with the, your two kids mm -hmm. yeah two. they went okay they went to a school that the ashram had oh, okay. i did their teacher training program and took some other courses and just totally immersed myself in that and where was it located I was in Portland, Oregon at the time. Right. So it was following Ananda. It was a U.S. ashram. So yeah. we were there for a community. I was allowed to leave and come back during the day, but I had certain duties and certain things I had to do uh, throughout yeah. the days, like Seva and, and, you know, our community meals and things like that. Okay, great. So did that experience prepare you and were you able to be more resilient to cope with what then happened, not being able to get a job in the industry again? It gave me a really good foundation and it gave me my second career path, which is what I do today. But yeah. there was a couple more events that happened in there that really defined what I do and yes. why I do what I do today. And okay. when I was at the ashram, I had a spiritual partner that I was with, and we had been together for about two years. And at the end of two years, he decided that he could become physically violent towards me. And right. so this uh, during one of the altercations, there was only two, he cut off my airway right here, mm -hmm. and I couldn't breathe. And just before I took my last breath, he took his hand off of me and pulled me up and wanted me to retaliate of which I couldn't. I just walked yeah. out of the room and, and left that situation. At the time, I was also studying a little bit with a medicine woman. And I had asked her if I could come to where she was at uh, and take my two children there because we needed to get to safety. Yeah. And she told me no. And that I couldn't bring that energy there to where she was because she was working. And then I mm -hmm. needed to figure out a plan of what I was going to do. And did I have money? And did I have a place somewhere else to go? Mm -hmm. And so I put that all together. A friend came up to visit me. And then the very next day, I had everything packed up and we left. And I went back to where I started. At the time, I went back to Idaho, where I had been living before. And... Um, started over. And I remember that entire drive praying and meditating and asking that if I and my children were kept safe, I would dedicate my life to this healing pathway and then share my message with the world. And that's exactly what's happened. And I haven't stopped in 12 years. Right. Great. Okay. So, and I'm really sorry to hear this happen to you, by the way um there are more and more stories coming out mm -hmm. every single day where women have been abused by men mm -hmm. in violent ways and non-violent ways and i know it's the other way around too but there's an overwhelming way where men are doing this yes and i have to say i say this to my wife almost every week now when we hear a story like that and i say i'm sometimes i am embarrassed to be a man um because i don't know why they are doing it and I, I don't think i will ever understand um so i'm i'm really sorry to hear this happen to you it taught me though one of the best lessons that could have ever have been taught the medicine yeah. woman did not enable me and allow me to become a victim she empowered me to take charge and control of my life 
And that's exactly what happened with her. Um, and I can see the wisdom and why she said no, whereas at the time I couldn't. But looking back on it today, that was the the the, the most gracious gift she could have ever given anybody. Yeah. That person that did that, he actually crossed over and died. I learned um, through an obituary that got sent to me that he had brain cancer. And knowing what I know about cancer, I traced it back to when the first beginnings of it would have been. And it would have been mm -hmm. right about the time that I left the relationship. Right. And right. I thought about it for a moment and realized that I was given a gift of life and this person's no longer here. So mm -hmm. if I was given a gift of life, I'm worthy to live this life and I'm worthy to live it with abundance and prosperity. And that's how I choose to live every day because I'm still here. And mm -hmm. that to me is one of the greatest things I could ever share or pass along that if you're here and you're listening to this, you are worthy and you are worthy to live each and every day abundantly and prosperously. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Okay, so that was 12 years ago yeah. that all happened. And mm -hmm. you said you, you would share your message out there. And how did that then evolve into something that would be a business for you so you could mm -hmm. earn money from it? How did that all develop from there? So I started working as a healer. And I studied different healing modalities, got certified in a few of them. Those really gave me form and structure. But because I also studied with the medicine woman, I also studied with Buddhist monks. I studied with yoga healers, shamans, you name it. I have studied along the way with different natural healers that passed along some of their gifts. And so today I get called a mind whisperer because I can help people or I empower them to step into their power to gain infinite results, to get infinite prosperity in that moment. And it all happens in how it works with the brain and the synapse and science and some things like that. But here I am 12 years later, I have an international practice shifting the energy behind the thought people have and the energy is emotion or feelings to create an outcome energetically through the subconscious. So it's subconscious work. It's not consciously aware um, because we'll hold a thought consciously, but yes. the subconscious is sending out the energy signals, the emotions and feelings. And so through that, I developed the practice and then I put out together a book called Financially Pit Fit, which is really the subconscious side of money. And then I have the Financially Fit program that goes along with it, how to shift and change that energy for yourself so you can move forward creating a life on purpose. Wonderful. And is, is that then like a, is it a coaching program? Is it healing, physical healing close by? Is it uh -huh. distant healing? Is it therapy? Is it just right. give us a picture of, uh -huh. if you know, if I called you up and went, right, I need some help in my life. You know, uh -huh. I've read your book. I've done this. What? Uh -huh. How can you help me develop the blueprint for my life to be okay. more health and financially fit? <laughs> So the areas that I work in that everybody all around the world have in common is they want better health, increased wealth, or an enhanced relationship. And when I really sat down and thought about it, people are really asking for happiness, prosperity, and love. Mm. So in any of the, one of those categories, you can do the work because the universe is all or nothing because it's based on vibration and frequency. Nikola Tesla yeah. said, if you want to know the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, vibration, and frequency. So in that term, it can affect and shift and change everything within a person's life and construct. So if you were to call me up and ask me, hey, I need help. This is where I'm at. We could do a couple of different things. I do do session packages for people who become clients where we would get together, usually just on the phone. And it's distant and we can go through and make those shifts and changes. 
And then for the person who wants to learn how to do this for themselves, then we go through the Financially Fit program. Now, the focus with Financially Fit, of course, is shifting and changing the beliefs and the energy around wealth, abundance, money, prosperity. But that is just the doorway that opens up for everything else. Because if you were to come to me for a financial issue and I asked you why you wanted it to change, you're going to probably tell me something about a relationship, something that you want for yourself, something that you want for your family. And then at the end, you're like, oh, that is that why I have this with my thyroid? You're like, well, yeah. So mm -hmm. how it works, your subconscious records everything from the moment that you were born to the day you exit this earth. And it's constantly assigning feelings and emotions to those events. Well, what happens is, is it creates an automated response system. And so we're only aware of this process happening maybe 10% of the time. And that's if you're Albert Einstein, because scientists yeah. measured his brain and his awareness level was 10%. So the other 90%, if we're using good whole round numbers, is just sending out energy signals that it magnetically attracts back to us. So they say your thoughts create your reality. You can hold the thought, but what attracts back is the energy, the emotion or feeling that you felt that comes magnetically back to you, not the thoughts. And so when we shift and change the energy underneath it, everything else in your life will shift and change, including your thought process to create a different outcome. Mm -hmm. And w the universe doesn't compartmentalize or separate. So if you come to me for a health issue, for example, and we work on health, it's going to open up the doorway for finances to come in and your money supply will also increase because the universe doesn't say, oh, you only feel this about health and you feel this about money. No, we mm -hmm. do that. The universe goes, oh, your, your feeling is resistance or your feeling is depression here half more. Oh, your feeling is joy. Your feeling is happiness here, half more. And that's how the universe works. Right. Wow. That's a, that's a quick description, how the universe works. Yes. Very fast. <laughs> Very fast. Um, okay. There's, there's a lot. I'm, I, I know some of this. Mm -hmm. I've studied some of this and I've heard some of this and I've practiced it as well. And what I've learned as well about myself, and there might be other people in the world that have similar similar things going on for them, is, well, in fact, I'll give you a quick story. You mentioned one of the things that you studied was Buddhism, or you had Buddhist practices where mm -hmm. you went. And I'm not by any means an expert in that area. You, you know more than I do. Although I came across a concept last year that I'd never had come across before called dependent origination mm -hmm. and the conditioned mind, which is one of the teachings of the Buddha. And I realized in myself that, oh my God, how conditioned is my mind? And it's been conditioned all my life, you know, from when I was a little boy mm -hmm. by my parents, by my teachers, by me, by society, yeah. by the media, by social media, by everything that comes towards me that I decide to take on board and believe and repeat and repeat and think about. And that then shows up in my life. And so I understand about that energy and the thought process and the mind. Well, I wouldn't say I understand. I have an inkling of how this could work. So my question for you then, after that quick kind of background, is to say, if all our minds are so conditioned and so mm -hmm. rehearsed to do the same thing, good or bad, over mm -hmm. and over again, and it's really difficult, to change it, how, how is your program and what you do will allow us, our conditioned mind, to uh -huh. kind of break down and, and unfold to, to do it differently, <laughs> to, you know, to create a new conditioning, let's put it that way. Do, mm -hmm. Am I making sense? Yes. And it all goes back to the emotions and feelings. 
So earlier I said the subconscious records everything from the moment you're born to the day you exit this yes. earth as an event. Yeah. And as it records, it's assigning emotions and feelings to those events. Mm. Yes. Which creates the conditioned mind or the automated response system. Yes. What we can do is we can reverse engineer that entire process. So I can ask you what it is that you want to change. And I actually did this uh, live Mm -hmm. in front of a group of people. I pulled a gentleman up from the audience and asked him that very question. And he said, I want to create more. I said, more what? He goes, more money. I said, Mm -hmm. okay, why? And he said, well, I'm okay, really at work. I'm comfortable where I'm at now. But every time I try to create more, it never happens. Hmm. And I want to do this because my boys are going to be going to college in a couple of years. And there's some things we want to do together as a family before they go off and live their own life. But I can't get there. And I said, well, how does that feel? He goes, I am so incredibly frustrated. So I know the feeling and emotion on the surface is frustration. We can go down many layers deep to really get to the heart of it. But this was a live example. So I had to be quick. Yes. And I said, well, where do you feel the frustration at in your body? And he goes, it's in my gut. There's this huge knot. Hmm. When was the first time you felt that? And the first memory that he could recall, the first event was when his parents got divorced and he was about nine. He was an right. only child. The more it got divided up, each family was fine and comfortable where they were, but the more didn't exist anymore. And because he was an only child, they put him in the middle and they played like a tug of war game with him which created the frustration. Mm. So this is how we can change it. In every moment, every frequency, every vibration, every emotion and feeling exists. It's just that his subconscious at that time got stuck on creating frustration and it didn't know to look outside of that paradigm for a different emotion or feeling. So in asking several different questions, we uncovered what he needed at age nine was to feel a sense of pride because he wanted his boys to respect and honor all the things that he's been able to do for them. So I, through meditation with the other person, whether I'm with you or distance, go through and ask for a different frequency to come in. And I witness that you feel it in your body instantaneously because our emotions and feelings happen fast. So if you were to rub an onion on the bottom of your foot, you would taste it in your mouth in a matter of moments. So Mm -hmm. instantly he saw a different paradigm when we asked for that change. So I asked him, well, what happened? Tell me, you know, what happened at age nine? He goes, this is the weirdest thing. He goes, my parents still got divorced, but I wasn't in the middle anymore. I remember I'm riding my bicycle and I'm happy and I'm playing with my friends. Yeah. But different reality got created because we shifted the emotion or the feeling to a different vibration. Well, frustration was only going so far out and it was magnetically attracting back to him. The pride, Mm -hmm. the honor, respect was going a lot further. And then he had happiness from it. So then that would go out to attract magnetically back to him. So then I asked him, I said, well, how, how's your gut? How's your stomach? And he goes, the knot is gone. (laughs) Well, the event never changes. The emotion or the feeling does, it creates a different outcome. And he was a thinner man, but he still looked like he dropped 20 pounds in front of a live audience because that energetic weight was gone. It was completely removed. Yeah. Two years later, this was this last year. His boys graduated high school, they're in college, and they got to do everything that they wanted to do as a family because he created it. Did he do anything different in what he was doing? No. The only thing that changed was he wasn't frustrated about it anymore. He had a different vibrational frequency. He did the exact same thing he had been doing for years. And if by magic, it worked because we offered it a different vibration and we, wow. in, we, we, ingrained that vibration in the subconscious it happens in the synapse between the two neurons where the hormones get created where it can shift and change and creates a new reality but you feel it through your body when it happens so that's how we can uncondition the mind to create a different reality because we're changing the fuel that we're giving the thought yeah yeah great thank you for that explanation that that's I love it to hear an example where that happens 
-hmm. and how this can develop. And the, do you believe that's a one-off exercise or does the individual need to keep repeating it every day in order for mm -hmm. it to be for a new conditioning to take place mm -hmm. like repeat you know do something every day for 30 days or 60 days or whatever what once once the initial change takes place it's done and it's right. complete what i have found is is that some things most things are multifaceted meaning that say you wanted to um, say you're holding on to resentment and anger about something. It and if it's over a long period of time, it can create different neuron pathways in the brain. And what we have to do is go in and each time clear. And when we come back to, you know, I have resentment for, you know, if it's really such a stronghold, you mm -hmm. might tell me a different event or a different story. So oftentimes I will go back and ask continually, well, tell me, what does it look like for you at age nine? Well, it's a little bit better. Um, I still have a little bit of sadness, for example. And mm -hmm. then I know I need to clear out sadness from that. Okay, how does it look again at age nine? Okay, it's better. Um, I don't feel anything, though. So that tells me I have to put something in. So it's a process because the brain is fluid and it's flexible and everything is malleable and every person has a different set of experiences. Mm. So some things like that example can be very, very quick, but then it'll bring up, well, what about this? And what about this? And can I change this? And yeah. so yeah. that's why I work in, you know, package sessions with clients because, it one thing will facilitate to the another. So when we do a minimum of at least three, we can go in, we can clear something in the past. The next time we get together, we see how it looks in the present day and we can fine tune it to making sure we're getting the results the way we want the results. Right. And then the third session was we're looking at the future to what we want to create, but we pull it into the present moment so we can have it now, not in four months. Right. And so the longer you do and the more sessions you do, the more we can facilitate that process and fine tune it because the brain is amazing. It's the most complex supercomputer out there. And sometimes there's programs stuck in there that might take a session or two or maybe three to figure out the deepest point of where this really originated from. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so that whole process, is that what you call the mind whispering? That's part of it. Yes. I call it yeah. thought form energy healing because so, what we're doing could you is repeat that mm -hmm, thought form energy healing. Because what we're doing is we're healing the energy underneath the thought forms that we have. Right. The mind whisper is what the media calls it because we're like, we don't know what you do, but mm. just like a horse whisper or a dog whisper, you work on people, but their minds. So we're going to call you the mind whisper. Gotcha. So that's how that came about. Okay, great. Yeah. I suppose it gives it a label without really understanding it, but you do understand it because you understand right. the horse whisperer. So right, and if, if the dog is, doing... yeah, if your dog oh, has dog behavior whisper, yeah. that you don't want, you take it to a dog whisperer, and then the dog That's whisperer it. works with the dog, and it comes back, and it's different. You yeah. have something in your mind that needs to shift. It's a conditioned belief pattern. You come, it shifts. You go back. It's different. okay. Okay, and then. Let's talk now then about the financially fit program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> so I got asked a lot, you know, can you teach this? And absolutely I can. And so the three categories, health, wealth, and relationships, I chose to work on the aspect of wealth first, because that's right. an entry point for everyone. And then all the other pieces fall into place from there. And so Financially Fit, it's a book, but it's also a program. And what you learn in that is some exercises that will help you get into a meditative state. Um, but more importantly, we go back to where these subconscious events got stuck and the programming that got stuck in there. And then I teach you through different stages how to change that 
vibration and that frequency. So a lot of the patterning comes from your childhood and from the people that raised you about money long before you even really knew what money was because you observed it from your parents Mm -hmm. and from your teachers and from your siblings and what they taught you. So that created your money spending pattern. So we can go in and start shifting and changing that. Then I'd also talk about vices and virtues. Vices are emotions and feelings that hold us back. But virtues are what propel us forward, the good moral characteristics. But what's really interesting about a lot of the vices and the virtues is the language patterning patterning relates to money. So like with words, when I was working with clients and it gets to the heart of the issue, they just go, well, I want to know that I'm worthy and that, you know, someone loved me and that I was appreciated and valued when I was little because I didn't feel that. And in the financial planning world, it's, well, here's your net worth. Here's your portfolio value. Here's your uh, your assets appreciated. Oh, do you have enough money to fund X, Y, Z goal? And if you didn't feel like you were enough on the inside, chances were you didn't have enough on the outside because money is emotional. It is fluid and it's going to respond to you based on your energy field with what you feel, yeah. not what you're thinking. And when clients started making that relationship, their money supply also increased and the words are identical and the feelings are identical. So if you don't feel like you're enough or that you're in lack energy, chances are you're probably lacking in finances. So it goes through that whole process and shows and shares about that. Then we go to the middle part and it's about um, manifestation and creation and how to do it from a conscious point of view to train the subconscious. And at the end, we're talking about your own affluence story. So we're creating that future piece, but bringing it into the present for you to live and have today. So the book takes you through that little journey. The coursework takes you through all of that as well to uh, facilitate you making all of those changes to move yourself forward as well, but from the viewpoint of money. Wow. Okay. Because I guess money is just one aspect of how that all got manifested, you know, years ago, uh, right. as you kind of explain. Um, yeah. I always, the, the one phrase that I always, I mean, you're hundred percent right. And I know this about myself because my father who I'm, I'm, I'm a Dutchman. My father was Dutch mm-hmm. and my mother was Indian, but my dad was, you know, I suppose the Dutch, the Dutch and the Scottish are kind of known for being quite tight with money. And although I wouldn't say we lacked things when we were younger, but it was tough. You know, uh, we had like four, I had three siblings. So there's four of us. So there's six of us. And we didn't have enough money at times. But the one thing my dad always repeatedly said to us kids was saying money doesn't grow on trees, you know, and he also used to point to his back and say, I haven't got any money on my back type of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you can find some, you know, pick it off my back. And right. all these kind of conditioning phrases about mm-hmm. lack, lack of money, um, mm-hmm. which, yeah, as you can tell, has stayed with me. <laughs> yes. mm-hmm. So and, and I, I bet lots of people have been through that. You know, mm-hmm. um, even you, when you were younger, you mentioned, you know, food stamps and right. dumpster diving and all sorts of other things, too. Yes. So the interesting thing, you know, you use the phrase money doesn't grow on trees. That's a phrase that I heard my entire life growing up. So I learned mm-hmm. not to ask for anything. Yeah. But money is a form of energy. So mm-hmm. energy doesn't grow on trees. Well, that's not true because energy does. There's leaves, <clears throat> there's branches, yeah. there's flowers, there's fruit. We mm. can take those things, make them into products or use them or sell them mm. and create an income from it. So mm. in really money does grow on trees. Does it's grow, yes. Yeah. perception of it because the trees and the plants and all of that are abundant because that's how we make everything. Yeah, that we have, you know, on earth, it comes from all of those types of things. So Mm. I just remember being so vivid in my imagination that when my parents said money doesn't grow on trees, I'd be off in dreamland going, 
well, what if there was, you know, $1 bills on each of the leaves and, you know, and you could take those and yeah. really yeah. that was the right perception because mm. energy grows on trees and money is a form of energy and yeah. that can be converted into money. Yeah. Because I mean, even I, I you know, I, I read somewhere recently that even people that have got abundant amount of money still mm-hmm. don't believe they are wealthy enough, you know, and are yeah. always trying to, they, they feel insecure because they don't mm-hmm. have enough. And they're, so they're also insecure because they're worried about losing it, Correct. And not having as much uh, because they're so used to it. So there's, there's both sides of the coin, isn't there? Right. There's, excuse the pun phrase but it's like you know poor people need more money but rich people want more money and they're afraid of losing their money (laughs) right and it all comes down to happiness which is on the inside we think money on the outside is going to provide happiness i know people though that don't have a lot of money that are extremely happy and i know people that are multi-millionaires going I don't know what makes me happy because I can have anything I want in the world. So we've, as a society have replaced our own happiness denoted on money and wealth. And if that's, what's at your core center, you're always going to be in that lack mode, no matter the dollar volume behind it. But if you return it back to your divine essence and happiness and understand truly that happiness is the doorway that opens yourself up to love which then will attract even more of that. So then money just happens when it goes back to that state of being, it's not going to matter the dollar, the dollar volume with it, because you already know who you are, what your purpose is and money will just flow in. And that's a whole concept that I talk about in financially fit as well. Great. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, the, whether it's right or wrong, I'm just kind of carefully thinking about my my statement that I was going to make. But it, the, there is an element of society, and I would say USA is probably one of the places where it's potentially the worst, where there's a lot of pressure on people to have that success yes. and being able to display that success through wealth and richness, whether it be in know your portfolio of properties your you know that it's not just the money you have in the bank you've got to show it off to say look how wealthy i am Mm -hmm. and i think in the western world particularly Mm -hmm. this is this is a huge thing so it comes back to that conditioning again you know where Mm -hmm. society around us is conditioning us to feel um not loved not happy not worthy if we don't have that in our lives Mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely Mm -hmm. i used to i have this little quote on my website and i used to think you know people would ask about success and failure and i'd say well there's not really success or failure it's about how you felt about the experience because what's successful to one person might be a failure to somebody else and what may be considered a failure could be a success. So it's about creating the experience. And if you liked the experience, repeat it. And if you didn't like the experience, do it differently. But then after that, in my own journey, I realized that it's not even so much about the experience that got created. It was about finding the silver lining gift in that experience. Mm. Yes, I co-created that one experience of where there was domestic abuse, but Mm. I didn't like the experience. I did change it, but I still, so what did I get out of that experience and why did it happen? Well, my silver lining gift was, I absolutely know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm truly worthy to live because Mm. I still am. And the other person isn't. So there's always a silver lining gift in the good things and the not so good things and the experiences. So It's just how our brain separates it into different categories for ourselves. And that is all based on the individual person's perception. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a lot to contemplate there and to think about. I I mean, 
I will definitely re-listen to this interview because <laughs> there are so many amazing nuggets that you're sharing with us. Okay, so we've covered covered the mind whisperer, thought form, energy healing mm -hmm. part, mm -hmm. and we've covered off the financially fit. Is there anything else that we've missed that I need to get you to share with us? The three greatest blocks that people tend to have is fear, doubt, and disbelief in themselves or their own process. Mm -hmm. To reverse that, to uncondition that part of the mind, to open up prosperity doors and everything else in your life, the three energies that are needed are trust, faith, and belief. And when I was going through all of those hard times, I wrote my own, I call it a mantra, um, little poem that I lived by that got me through all of those really hard, tough times. And it is trust and you will see, believe and you will know, have faith, all was well, follow your heart and spirit will lead you. And so that's something that I share and that to keep me in that faith, trust and belief to overcome my own fear, doubts and disbelief. I love it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's a beautiful mantra meditation. Yeah. It just makes complete sense. You know, it, it even kind of makes you, um, as you were saying it, it just makes you feel warm inside, <laughs> you know, it just, it just resonates um, so perfectly. It, and it's simple as well. Um yeah, hundred percent. Well, thank you for that, Donna. It's so wonderful to speak with you about all of this stuff, which, you know, something that's been kind of running through my life, my wife's life, you know, mm -hmm. um, our lives together as well. But you, you never, we we never are tired of learning newer ideas and concepts, and. There are lots of teachers out there that teach similar stuff, but you've packaged it or explained it in a, a really mm -hmm. nice and coherent way. And obviously the journey you've been on, the learning that you've gone through, the ashram experience uh, was all, all of it was divine timing, of course. All of it, yes. Uh, and for you to spread this message. Okay. How can people get in touch with you, Donna? Uh, where can they find you? And if they want to learn more, buy your book, uh, you know, book on a program or even just follow you and, and pick up any other nuggets that you're putting out there. So the easiest way is just through my website, DonnaCampbell.com. And that's just D-A-W-N-A Campbell.com. I'm also in social media. So if you were to find me on Facebook or Instagram, there's LinkedIn, you just type in my name and I should come up. And then for Financially Fit, it is on Amazon internationally for the Financially Fit book, if you wanted a copy of that. And if you chose to go into the program, it's on the website and then the book comes with the program. Great, great. Thank you so much for your time. I, I loved hearing your story. I love what you're doing. Um, oh, just one last question. Mm -hmm. If you had a, you know, wish or a plan or a vision for mm -hmm. what you're doing, yeah. where would you, how would you like it to grow? Where do you have a vision for yourself in where this could go to? Yes. Um, I've been working in the private sector and for the last, well, for the last 12 years, but the last two years of that, I've been taking out of the private sector, going to the global stage. So yes, sharing on podcasts and different forums like this, the radio, but I've also gone into the realm of professional speaking. So I've been going out on various stages teaching and sharing aspects of the Financially Fit program, how this works, and then taking that internationally. Because what I can do for one person individually on the phone, I can do simultaneously to an entire stadium at the same time 
through the sharing and the message, the exact same process. And so it's really taking that, going to the global stage, and then traveling around and taking it into countries where they may not have the resources available to do a charitable give back. And one of the places that um, one of the charities that I work with is M5M Foundation, where they provide healthy, nutritious meals to children all around the world. They're in 26 different countries. And I'm going to be starting doing some mission work with them as well as I give a percentage of all my proceeds to that because that's something near and dear to me. But then I can go also share my message when I'm there. So that's where I'm going over the next three to five years. So one of the things you'd like to do, if you haven't already, is come to the UK, correct? Absolutely. And I'm tentatively scheduled to come to London this next March. Okay. Soon. Well, soon. (laughs) Very, very soon. Okay. Well, please keep us posted. Yes. That providing this. Okay. That's what it's all hinging on. (laughs) Pardon? Our travel, re- it's all hinging on our travel requirements at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's set the intention that this ridiculous Omicron scare is right. gone by then uh, right. and that you can travel freely. <laughs> right. So I'm scheduled, I'm booked to be there on a speaking platform with a number of other speakers. And it's yeah. just a matter of fine tuning and making sure that we can all go. Because once I'm there, I'm going to be talking about the financially fit program. I'm going to be uh, sharing that. And then it's, do I teach it digitally or do I go back to London in a couple of months and teach it live? So it's all going to depend on the world economics with all of yeah, that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, and are you able yet to share what the event is called? Yes, it's um, White Label Expo is what it's called. It's a uh, big event. I believe there's 26,000 people registered for the expo. Um, And I'm going to be there with Bill Walsh. He's one of the top 10 business gurus in the United States and his company, Power Team USA. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll definitely look out for that. Do keep me posted on that as well. Um, Who knows? I might be able to make it down there. That might be fun. So okay. I'm not too sure of all the details and exactly where it's at, but it's got to be a very large convention hall type building to hold 26,000 people. So. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can think of a place it's, that can hold that. It's the London Excel. That's usually where Tony Robbins goes with 30,000 people. I've been there many times with him. So, um Okay. Thank you, Donna. Wonderful to speak with you. And who knows, we might meet each other in person. We just might. Yes. Who knew? <laughs> that, will, that will be awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Take care. Thank Bye you. for now. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests. So do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.